Hello, if you're a new listener, welcome to the podcast. My name's Craig, and if you're not a new listener, you might be wondering about Reza. Where is he? Well, Reza is not with me today. This podcast is a bonus episode for you with English teacher and podcaster Luke Thompson. Now, Luke and I interviewed each other back in 2016, and we thought it was time to catch up on what we've been doing these past five years. We speak about teaching and what it's been like for us under COVID conditions. We also talk about Brexit, English tea, the worst jobs we've ever had, and what it's like living abroad for both of us. Now, Luke lives in Paris. That's Paris, France, not Paris, Texas, for anyone living in the US. I wanted to bring Luke onto the podcast because I wanted you to get to know him. If you're listening to Reza and me because you want to improve your English, then you should listen to Luke as well. You can find his podcasts at teacherluke, that's L-U-K-E, dot co, dot U-K, and wherever you listen to your podcasts. So, without further ado, which means that's it from me, I'm not going to speak anymore, here's the conversation I had with Luke from Luke's English Podcast. Greg, it's really nice to see you again and nice to speak to you again. It's been five years since we last spoke. I know. Why Why have we waited so long before talking again? It's crazy. It's, it's really good to see you, Luke. It's really good to talk to you again. You too. We should also say hello to Catty and the chat box community on Facebook because it was Catty Ortega who kind of gave us a nudge to record another episode together. Yes, they're doing a wonderful job over there on on the chat box on Facebook. Not only Catty, but Ever as well, Everlax and the other admins and contributors to the Facebook page. If you want to practice your English and get involved in a very active Facebook page, I think, Luke, you'll agree, you can't do better than going over to the chat box and joining that group. They're very, very active and it's a very caring community. I like it very much. And it's well moderated as well, which is important. Like they've, they have clear rules to make sure that there are no time wasters, basically, exactly. in the group, which is a really good thing. So hello, Catty, and hello to the other chat boxes. And uh, thanks for kind of, yeah, giving us a nudge to do this again. So yeah, it's been five years then, Craig. So what's what's been going on with you? What's changed? What have you been up to? What have you been doing? Well, obviously, what's on my mind and most people's mind at the moment is the COVID thing. That's obviously affected my life and pretty much everybody's life. But um, looking back, like from five years ago, I got married. So I've been married for five years. Thank you very much. A very small affair. The family wasn't invited. There were only five people there. That's a long story that perhaps we (laughs) we shouldn't go into. But I'd been... (laughs) I'd been with my with my girlfriend for more than 20 years. So it was really just a marriage that we thought, yeah, it's time. You know, we, we should do this. So yeah. um, we went for sushi after and um, I've been happily married for five years. Very nice. Can you notice any difference between being married and not being married? Is there a noticeable change? None whatsoever. Absolutely nothing at all. No, except, of course, because of Brexit, it makes me feel a little bit more secure in Spain because I'm married to a Spanish citizen. So that helps, obviously. Yeah, me too. Same story. So uh, being married, yeah, I feel a lot more secure. I mean, I don't expect guys in like I don't expect a SWAT team to come round and (laughs) knock on the door, you know, Monsieur Thompson. And then like to be dragged away to some cell somewhere on in Calais. Uh, I don't expect that to happen anyway, but uh, still, it does make me feel a bit more secure that I'm married to a French person. Do you have Spanish citizenship? I have Spanish permanent residency. So I have a card with a, with a photo on, which is really nice because before they just had a piece of A4 paper with no photo. So I've got this kind of official looking card to say I'm a permanent resident. And it has my my number on it, my residency number. So that's kind of official. I can show that in the bank. I can show that to a policeman. It has my address on it. How are you over there with, with French law? Similar story. So I, I, I could apply for French citizenship. And a number of my friends have, like, for example, Amber, who's a regular 
normally a, a regular guest on my show, English girl living in France. So she's got French citizenship. So I could apply for it and I would probably get it. For example, you know, being married, having a child, having lived here for a certain number of years, having a permanent contract with the school I work for. And my French is basically good enough. So I passed the, the test to get the bare minimum B1 level uh, a couple of years ago. So my French is certifiably okay. In my everyday life, it's a kind of a different story. But according, as far as the government's concerned, I'm all right. So I could apply for French citizenship, but it's the paperwork is an absolute bloody nightmare. Yeah, here too. They require birth certificates of like everyone in my family, and they've each birth certificate has to be at least three months old, <laughs> which I don't understand. Yeah, it's a bureaucratic nightmare, isn't it? It is. So there's that. So I, sh I could and should apply for that. In fact, my dad's constantly badgering me, like, you know, get your French citizenship, blah, blah, blah. But I do have a carte de séjour, which is, a guess, I guess, similar to yours. It's a, it's a residency permit. And it's, it's worth 10 years. It was pretty easy to get. So I guess when that runs out, in theory, they'll give me another one, unless they decide, bah, no, uh, England... Uh you stupid English, uh, Brexit, quoi. then maybe they'll they'll say, sorry, no, but uh, I'm all right, basically. But you mentioned the birth of your daughter. She Is she three now? She is. She's, she's coming up to three and a half. And yeah. So that's quite a big thing that's happened to you in the last five years. Yes, exactly. So yeah, since we last spoke, yeah. I mean, I, I got married too. I don't know if I got married. I think I got married like uh, in the same year that I, I spoke to you. So maybe I spoke to you just before I got married, but uh, we got married as well. And yes, uh, so we had a, a daughter. Yeah, that's obviously kind of a big thing. And uh, that's that's great. There was an episode you did that I loved. And for my listeners, it's episode 502 of Luke's English podcast, The Birth of My Daughter which I found very wonderful to listen to. It's very emotional, very honest, very funny and very touching. So, I mean, maybe you've got a suggestion for my listeners of where they can start listening to your podcast, but I love that episode. So would you suggest that for any new listener to go and have an idea of what, what your podcasts are about? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, any, anything, whatever kind of um, you know, grabs your interest. People often mention that episode. I guess because it's so personal and yes, and the, the things you mentioned. You, pour, you pulled back the curtain, as the Wizard of Oz did. You pulled back the curtain into your life, and, and it was a very um, – you made yourself sound very vulnerable, uh, and it was also very funny and very touching. So well done on that. All oh, right. Well, yeah, they could listen – people could listen to that. Otherwise, I don't know, just any episode, really. I can't tell sometimes how people get into my, my podcast – People seem to just get into it, just listening to any episode, really. But that might be a good one. Uh, otherwise, more recently, I've done one called Welcome Back to Luke's English Podcast. And I'm just checking my archive here on my website. And that one was episode number 699. 699 might be a good place to start. They could just go to my website, teacherluke.co.uk, and there's an episode archive there where they can find all the episodes. I've got an app as well, which is free, and it contains the entire episode archive. And so people could just go to the app store on their phones and search for Luke's English Podcast app. And I've got a YouTube channel as well. I put all the episodes up on YouTube too. That's Luke's English Podcast on YouTube. And congratulations on reaching 100,000 YouTube subscribers. That's a landmark. Yeah, that's right. It is a landmark. I mean, you know, it's just a nominal thing, isn't it? Did you get the YouTube thing in the post that they send? The shiny thing. The shiny thing. Yeah. Uh, when you get to 100,000 subscribers, YouTube send you, well, in theory, they send you a shiny plaque, which is like this kind of silver thing with a YouTube logo on it. And it says, congratulations, you reached 100,000 subscribers. And you can proudly display it on the wall behind you. So, no, they haven't sent it to me yet. yet. Apparently, it takes quite a while. First of all, YouTube will blank you for ages. They'll just kind of ignore you for, for a while because they're too cool. Then eventually, they will realize that you've reached 100,000 subscribers. And then they send you a message saying, you now have to apply to receive the shiny thing. So you've got to jump through hoops. You've got to do certain things. You've probably got to verify a telephone number or something so that... If they want to, they can sell all your data to that SWAT team I mentioned earlier. Yeah, of course. 
yeah. 100,000 subscribers. Uh, but yeah, so in theory, eventually I will receive a shiny thing and then I'll be, I don't know what, I'll be happy. Yeah, and shiny. Shiny things. We like shiny things, don't we, humans? <laughs> 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 so we're uh, we're currently doing a podcast crossover in this episode, aren't we, Craig? Where yes. we're both going to be publishing this on our respective podcasts. So for my listeners, this is Craig. So Craig, what's the, where's the best place to find your podcast? Well, the URL, the address on the internet is inglespodcast.com. And the name of the podcast is Aprender Inglés con Reza y Craig. I do the podcast with a po- with, with the po- with the podcast with a podcast. <laughs> Have you ever done a podcast with a podcast? A podcast is like a co-host, but on a podcast. On a podcast, yeah, yeah. My good friend and co-host Reza does it with me, so that's where you can find it. Yeah, it's very nice. So in November, was it you? Uh, you published Craig's story, the story of Craig. Yes. Yeah, I did. I think that was November uh, last year. So I remember seeing the notification of that one arriving on my phone and I did listen to it while I was like preparing dinner for my daughter. She was watching cartoons. Thank you. And so I was, I was, you know, we're already, we've already become one of those families where everyone's stuck on their own devices and stuff. Anyway. Are you homeschooling your daughter? I should just say that we're recording this in April 2021 and we're still in the coronavirus pandemic so that's why i asked the question no for most of the last year and a half she has been able to go to school the first lockdown which i guess started in march of 2020 she wasn't at school they closed everything in fact she was at crash at that time she was at daycare because she wasn't old enough to be at school and so the, the 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 daycare center closed and so she was at home with us all the time that was a bit tricky not just spending time with our daughter because obviously we love that but it's tricky to get other things done uh and you know for my wife to do her work and for me to be able to record my episodes and stuff and she was at home all the time and so that was a bit tough but then in i guess i guess it was probably summertime june maybe Anyway, in any case, after the summer holidays, schools opened and stuff, and my daughter went to school, and she's been going to school. They've managed to keep the schools open, which I don't understand how. I don't really understand all the the confinement measures. But then, just recently, Emmanuel Macron, the French president, did make an announcement saying, oh, we are going to close all the schools. Did he say it like that? No. No. Okay. Uh, Thankfully. (laughs) He said it in actual good French. But um, they closed the schools, so... We're looking at three weeks of no school, but my daughter has gone to her grandparents. We're lucky that we've got, you know, that my wife's parents are available. And so she's gone to stay with them. And that's within the rules. We were allowed to travel for family reasons like that. So that's okay. So she's actually away at the moment. So my wife and I are kind of, wow, just we've got our freedom. We've got our lives back. (laughs) So weird. Yeah, it's uh, it's difficult with young kids, with young children in the house, and it's as though it's lovely to spend time together. I would imagine that there's a time when you're trying to work and you're trying to take care of the family and you're trying to prepare food, and and it's all a bit much. I would think. Yeah, and also people who've got kids will know that when you've got like a two or three year old, they tend to sort of dominate proceedings, especially if they don't have brothers and sisters who will play with them. If it's just you and your wife and a, and a little child. It's hard to do anything else other than just be with her because at that age, they're not really independent. When she's a teenager, she won't want to have anything to do with us. She'll be in her room and we'll be like, do you not want to come and spend time with us? And she'll be like, no, leave me alone. Close the door, <laughs> I expect. But at this stage, uh, she can't do anything on her own, really. She needs to be with her mummy and daddy. And even if you if you say, okay, you play there and I'm going to do work on the computer here, it doesn't work. She's always coming over. She wants to see what you're doing and stuff like that. She's very cute. I'm sure she is. And another episode I, I enjoyed was episode 634 in which well, you, you got, had- you got uh, your numbers sorted. That's This is amazing. Well, I want, I want to send people over there. If you haven't heard this episode, if you're a lapster or an alcoholic. I recommend this episode. It's a new alcoholic, not alcoholic, a new year ramble for 2020 part one. So I'm going back um, over a year when your daughter said the word Beatles and you were very excited. So my question is, have there been any advances in, in that area of music with your daughter? Do you play her Beatles music? Is she singing yet? 
constantly playing her the Beatles and we often will watch Beatle videos on YouTube and she likes it, which I'm delighted about. I mean, I hope that she continues to like it. You know, it's not that she just, as a three-year-old, has no critical faculties and just any kind of moving image on a screen. She's like, this is great. Uh, I hope that she won't like hit her fifth or sixth birthday and then look at the Beatles and go, oh, no, dad, they're rubbish. I hope that she won't do that. I think that she won't because I think the Beatles are great and that watching videos of them is fascinating because they've got so much charm and they're just so great to watch. So, yes, we do watch lots of Beatles stuff and listen to a lot of songs. And she sings as well. She does sing. It's it's fantastic. She sings and dances. But she loves to sing. You know, she's a kid, so she loves like Frozen and yeah, Paw Patrol and PJ Masks and stuff. Do you know all of those shows? I don't because I don't have children myself, but I've heard of them through friends who have kids. Are you bringing her up in, in both languages, in French and in English? That's the idea, yes, yeah, uh, French and English, although she gets a lot more French in her life than English because she, at school it's obviously all in French. Of course. Uh, but at home it's mostly English. I speak to her only in English. My wife and I speak English to each other, and my wife speaks a mixture of English and French to uh, her. And so, yeah, she understands French and English perfectly. Well, you know, for a three-year-old, the same level as normal. She understands both. And she speaks a sort of a mix of French and English, literally even in a sentence. She says things like, oh, no, je pas like that. <laughs> half and half. Although I think she speaks more French than English, to be honest. My wife thinks it's not true. She's like, no, no, she speaks loads of English. And I'm like, no, she doesn't. She speaks more French than English. So I'm always like trying to natter away to her in English because I am her prime source of English. Yeah. So hopefully in the future, she, the, the two languages will diverge as she becomes more aware of the differences. She knows English and French. She does know the difference, but hopefully she, the two things will diverge and she won't mix them up so much. But it's very interesting to see her, her linguistic development. I've heard from friends here who have kids of a similar age or even older, so five or six, that their receptive skills are much more attuned to it, to English or to the language that's spoken at home than their productive skills because that's what they're producing outside the home. There's a guy who has a very interesting podcast on this. He's a Spanish guy called Alex Perdel, and uh, I'll put a link in the show notes and I'll send you one if you want one also. Link. Uh, link? Luke, it's called Crefer. <laughs> I haven't had that one before. My, <laughs> I've had very, I've had normally get Luke, Luck or Look, but uh, Link is a new Link, one. Link, yes. That I sound like I'm in the Legend of Zelda. Link's English podcast. It's called Crefer in English. So he's bringing his child up in English, even though he's a Spanish speaker. It's a very interesting podcast. He speaks about the theory, linguistic theory of doing that. That's wonderful because I have got a kind of series of episodes uh, about raising bilingual children. I say I've got a series. I've done one part like quite a few months ago, but uh, it's something I'm always wanting to do. So yes, I'd like to, I'd definitely like to find out more about Alex and see maybe if I can talk to him. I think he, that, that would be very interesting. I feel like I should be asking you some questions now. Ask me, ask away, Luke. Okay. So you mentioned Lepsters who are listeners to my podcast, but then you also mentioned Aircoholics. So not alcoholics, people who can't stop drinking alcohol, but aircoholics. What's what's an aircoholic then? Well, we've taken the the letters of the podcast aprender a inglés i, and then you got r, and then you've got r. Thank you, uh, Reza. That's my co-host, and Craig. That's a c. So a i r c is the aircoholic. But sometimes we get messages from our lovely audience and they say hello my name's maria and i'm an alcoholic and it sounds like we're in a meeting of alcoholics anonymous so it's it's quite funny and we have to explain it all the time because when we say if you're an alcoholic but we have to explain what that is because people might think it they've listened by some chance to an alcoholic podcast yeah, it's kind of funny, isn't it, that that um, with our podcasts for, for learners of English, that we create these acronyms, which and a, and a point of an acronym is it's supposed to save time. It's supposed to be more efficient. Exactly. And then we send, spend ages having to explain, explain what the it. acronym is. So I'm, I'm going, so hello, Lepsters. Um, by the way, Lepsters are people who listen to my podcast, Luke's English Podcast. That's L-E-P, Lepsters. Okay. You know, it's sort of counterintuitive. Is that the right phrase for that? Counterproductive. Yeah. 
counterproductive, but that's all part of the fun. So, uh, aprenda ingles con reze, Craig. Yes. Check out my English accent there in speaking Spanish. Trey bien. So, you're, I guess most of your listeners speak Spanish as a first language. Is this correct, or do you have... Uh, no, that's correct. Most of them. Not all of them, most of them. Okay, so... I mean, you know, I would say to my audience that if you are a Spanish speaker, then you must become an alcoholic. You must listen to Craig's podcast because a lot of the time you're doing things like making little little corrections from your listeners. So your listeners send in voice messages, which you use as the basis for your episodes, which is very nice, a very nice approach that you play a little message from a listener. And invariably, they are a Spanish speaker. And then you and, and Reza will kind of correct some of the errors that you hear. And then you'll build your episode based on the question. So it's very nice. And it's a great way to, to have certain little common Spanish errors corrected in each episode. So Spanish speakers, you must listen to Aprenda Inglés con Reza y Craig. I expect many of them already do. But um, just a reminder, if you are listening to it, good, keep listening. And if you don't, start. And you can go to englishpodcast.com. Yes. Right? That's correct. Okay, cool. So let's see. I've got other questions. We There's billions of things we could talk about. I wrote down some notes before we started recording, and there's no way we're going to cover everything. So, so perhaps we'll have to do a round two at some point, or a round three even. Let's see. Well, I'm going to dip into to my just sort of like other questions category. So I'm going to sidestep Brexit. I have a Brexit question. Well, no, I won't. I forget. I've mentioned it. I've released the beast. <laughs> I've said the B word. Uh, you did an episode about Brexit in December. So basically, as a as a an expat, are you, do you consider yourself to be an expat? Yes. Okay. So, and as an as an expat living in Spain, has Brexit affected you? very much. No, not at all. Absolutely not, because I've been living here since 1997. My family are also here. My wife's Spanish, my job's very permanent here. So um, I don't think there's any possibility at this stage that I'd be thinking of going back to the UK, even to visit, because friends I have there come to visit us here because we, we live in Valencia near the beach. Why would I go to rainy UK? There are things I miss, but it doesn't make sense for me to, to go there and visit. There's just no reason for it. Are there not English people living in Spain who are going to be affected by Brexit? You know, I, so you, you sort of see little headlines in, on websites and on, online about, you know, English homeowners in Spain. The, the, in fact, the ones in many cases who actually voted in favour of Brexit, that these people's lives are somehow under threat. Do you know anything about this? Because there are lots of English expats who live in certain areas of Spain. Yes. The very Brexity types, let's say, who love to basically recreate England, but with nice weather. <laughs> and they, they, they're not interested in integrating into Spanish culture exactly. They just want, you know, the English pub, fish and chips, and, uh, you know, cook breakfast and the beach, right? And a lot of them voted for Brexit, which is weird. And now they're like, apparently the, the, their lives are under threat. But anyway. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, you, you've hit the nail on the head. To hit the nail on the head means you're absolutely 100% correct. Because where my sister lives, now she lives about an hour and a half down the coast from me. I live in Valencia and she lives in an area on the Costa Blanca, on the east coast of Spain, where there are expats very similar to the ones you've described. And... Some of them are really caught between a rock and a hard place. They're, they're in a position that's very difficult. They can't easily travel now between here and the UK, between Spain and the UK, apart from the coronavirus restrictions. They've also got the problem now of leaving Europe and going into a country that is not part of Europe. And that causes all sorts of problems. Also for people working. People working in the UK and in Spain, you have to have special permissions now. So it's, it's very, very complicated. And if you're not on one side of the fence or the other, then there's all sorts. It's a bureaucratic nightmare for many people. And I agree 100% with what your dad said in a recent episode. Was that 704? So I've got all the numbers here, Luke. Episode you do, 704. You've got all the your dad spoke with you about Brexit. And I agree with him 100% on his point of view there. Okay. Well, I think the point was basically it's a really bad idea, isn't it? Yes. 
but it, but it doesn't affect me, so I don't care because I'm quite happy here in Spain. I mean, do you feel the same as me, or are you quite um, disturbed by it all? We haven't really seen the direct impact of it yet because the coronavirus has totally got in the way, in a sense, because we haven't been able to travel. I haven't really seen those things. But if I wasn't married, if I didn't have the you know residency permit, the carte de séjour that I mentioned, if I didn't have those things in place, then I expect life would be more complicated, that I'd have to apply for some kind of visa and it might be, you know, there'd be various other complications. But since I'm already settled here and blah, 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 I think that makes things more easy. But when it comes to traveling, I wonder what's going to happen. So traveling back to the UK or from the UK back to France, or even traveling between other European countries, maybe by plane. And I'm there with my British passport. I got a new one, by the way, it had to be renewed. So I've got my new British passport. It's dark blue. So those Brexiters got what they wanted, the coveted blue passport. <laughs> anyway, so I'll be there with my British passport, which doesn't have European Union on the top anymore. Whereas my wife and daughter will be there with their European Union passports. So maybe uh, I will have to queue up longer than them. I might get stuck in, in long queues at immigration. I don't know. Yeah. Well, you are in slightly a different boat because I think you've got stronger connections to the UK than I than I do. You've got your family there and they want to see their, their granddaughter. So you'll be going back probably when you can. Yeah, yeah. Try and go back as regularly as possible. Exactly. So it remains to be seen how complicated it's going to be. In terms of other stuff, I mean, you know, what I... We could talk about our personal experiences. We are, as we've said, we are quite sort of lucky in the sense that um, we're quite secure in our lives here and, and so on. And, and so it's, it's not affecting us that much. What I'm concerned about is how it's going to affect the UK in general and how everyone's lives are going to be affected, especially the sorts of people who probably voted for Brexit themselves, you know, people in working class communities, people in northern towns and stuff like that. And it seems the way that things are going, those people face a lot of difficulties with uh, lots of job losses. It's not just about students or the kids of sort of rich middle-class families who, you know, want to go on their gap year, you know, oh no, like da daddy says I can't do my gap year this time. You know, it's, it's not just those people who can't go and swan off to Europe and go traveling and stuff. It's people whose lives are going to be demonstrably worse because of the economic fallout that is invariably going to happen as a result of uh, of this bad decision. And I wonder why it's happening in the first place and what the motivations behind it are. I'm, gonna, I'm ranting now, but um, it seems that the people who are really going to benefit from this are sort of like hedge fund managers and bankers who have vested interests in getting out of the regulatory framework of the EU. And Britain, possibly, not even Britain, England – could become some sort of tax haven for the super rich and they will be laughing it up whereas the ordinary folk will probably suffer in various ways so this is the depressing thing i think i think you make very good points and i agree with you i think there was probably quite a bit of political manipulation on the public in the beginning letting them think as your dad said that it would be really really good for them but not giving them all the facts and I think people now are more aware of the negative side of Brexit. And I don't think they were when they voted for it nearly four years ago. So, But basically, you know, you make your decisions based on what you think at the time. And then you, you, there's an expression in English, you make your bed and you lie in it. So whatever you decide, you have to deal with the consequences and accept the consequences of your actions. I might sound not very sympathetic, but I'm not very sympathetic because I don't have to go through the hardships. I live in Europe and I'm really pleased I live in Europe. And I feel, I feel bad for people who have to suffer the possible effects of Brexit. And let's face it, we don't know yet what's going to happen. We could be totally wrong, but I suspect it, it's not going to be good for, for that class of people in the UK that don't have a high income. I think they're going to, to suffer. Yeah. A lot of people, you know, said this from the very start, like this This is going to be very damaging in various ways and it's it's a reckless thing to do and it's not necessarily going to be the solution to all the issues that, you, that we have as a country. People were concerned about immigration and those things. Brexit's not necessarily the solution to those to those things. And the, the, those points were made, but they were shot down as like, no, this is just project fear um, and so on. 
But anyway, but speaking personally, like you, it's it's not affecting my life that much, except that in Paris, we have a chain of Marks and Spencer's shops. Do you have them in Spain? We did, but they closed. They closed. Like, did they close before Brexit or just like years before? Or? Years before Brexit. They moved out of the Spanish market, I think. Yeah, completely. So I don't think there are any M&S, Marks and Spencer's shops left in Spain. This is just speaking personally, right? That um, Marks and Sparks as we call it, Marks and Sparks, is a, a sort of a lifeline for me because that's where I would buy bread that I like, although the bread here is flipping brilliant, right, in Paris. Oh, of course. Is that where, you're, where you get your Thompson tea in Marks and Spencers? So the Thompson's tea that you saw me buy because I posted a photo on Twitter, the Thompson's tea, I, I actually ordered it online. I probably paid too much, but I just thought I'm willing to pay extra for tea with my name on it. It's very good tea as well, apart from the fact that it's a Thompson tea. It's very, very good tea. Is it very good tea? I have the Irish blend here. Right. So, yeah, my friend Alex recommended it to me. I was like, right, I'm willing to pay extra for decent tea. So, uh, no, that's not where I get Thompson tea. I had to order that from from Northern Ireland, from Belfast, where I think it's packaged and stuff. No, I get Marks and Spencer's luxury gold tea, which is, oh, that's a good cup of tea, Craig. Strong, isn't it? Oh, it's strong and quality. Oh, I can't. Once you've gone gold, you can't go back. I can't drink PG tips anymore. It tastes like cardboard. Cardboard tea. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the thing is, Marks and Spencer's here has been hit fairly hard. And I think it's Brexit that for some reason they've got like issues with getting stock in the shelves. And so the beer that I used to get is no longer available. So I can no longer get that nice beer. So it's not that bad. Yeah. What about you? Where where do you get your tea? Where where do you procure your your tea? My co-host on the podcast, Reza, is from Belfast. So when he goes to visit his family, he buys me a packet of Thompson's tea. However, because of the coronavirus pandemic, he hasn't been able to go back. So I'm nearly at the stage where I might have to reuse a tea bag, which is something (gasps) I haven't done since my student days. Yeah, I know. I can see the shock on your face as I say that. So, yeah, we can get other teas here, but um, PG Tips and Tetley, but uh, I I really like the Thompson brand. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But can I ask you something now? Um, Let's try and, and look from an optimistic point of view at the coronavirus thing. What positive things can you think of, if any, that have come out of the last year since coronavirus hit? A few things. So speaking in terms of daily life in Paris, I feel like the Parisians have learned how to queue up properly. (laughs) (laughs) This is my personal gripe, okay? One of my little petty pet peeves, little things that annoy me, which I sort of maybe enjoy being irritated by. And, And it's queuing up. I mean, I get very annoyed by people not queuing up properly in shops. And I've talked about this many times before. In fact, some people are like, oh, here we go again, as they listen to me mentioning this. But queuing up, yeah, it does my head in that people will jump ahead of you in the queue and pretend that they didn't realise. Like, oh, sorry. No, you're not sorry. (laughs) And then they'll say, oh, sorry. And then they're still jumping in the queue. You know, it's like, well, if you're sorry, get to the back of the queue, you know. And But now, since the coronavirus came along, they put markings on the ground. There's no excuse now, yeah. A lot more rules that dictate that you've got to stand here and here and here and here. And so that has helped. During the lockdown, it was very quiet, and that was just very peaceful. It was a bit disturbing and scary in a sort of end of the world kind of way. Exactly. I felt the same. Yeah. Going out into the street and walking around with nobody there and the occasional... And in the beginning, I wasn't sure how bad this virus was. So, of course, I crossed the street, even though I was wearing a mask, not to be on the same pavement, the same side of the street as the person. I immediately crossed over and very everyone was very suspicious. The first couple of months were really quite disturbing, a bit like an apocalypse film. Yeah, exactly. We've all seen those films and played those computer games and stuff, and it felt a bit like that. It's like, oh, this is weird. But then, on the other hand, Paris was so calm and peaceful and quiet. A lot of people left the city, and Paris can be a – it's a beautiful place, but it can be quite a stressful and crowded place too, especially if you just live here day by day if you're not on a holiday. So it was a kind of a nice 
relief to have like a bit of peace and quiet. So it was actually kind of weirdly serene and peaceful. How about work? How did it affect the way you work? Because you also teach, don't you? You do classroom teaching. So yes, normally I teach classes at the British Council here in Paris and teaching group classes. And so with the restrictions, sometimes when the government said, oh no, you can do this, but you can't do this, you know, when they changed the restrictions, I had to change to teaching on Zoom. Yeah, so Zoom classes. So that was a bit of an adjustment at the beginning because normally when I'm teaching in class, the actual physical side of moving around the room and the physical proximity was actually quite a large part of my teaching. For example, stepping forward to get their attention, stepping back to show them that it's their chance to speak. You know, the way that you kind of manage the room just with your body language. Yes. A lot of that's unconsciously done. And also being able to, if you put them in pairs to do speaking practice, squatting down at the table to listen in on their conversation, that was all gone. So Instead, you have to manage the technology and using things like breakout rooms, putting students into groups of two or three and sort of multitasking while teaching and also kind of trying to manage how Zoom works. So that was a learning curve. But I actually quite like teaching on Zoom these days. Would you say you preferred it to classroom teaching? I know it's different. It's two different things, but... Swings and roundabouts. There are good and bad things. The things I like about Zoom teaching is that, well, first of all, when the class is finished, you're at home. Right. So normally, if I teach in the teaching center, uh, my class is finished and then I have to like tidy up the room, the classroom, rearrange the classroom so it's ready for the next teacher, go downstairs, blah, 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 blah. I mean, it's good to see my colleagues. I do miss the, you know, the personal contacts and stuff. And then I'd have to like, you know, travel home on the metro and all that stuff. It takes a lot of time. But now it's like, okay, everyone, bye bye. I hope you enjoyed the lesson don't forget to do your homework and then (laughs) click. And then I'm like, okay, I'm here. I'm at home. I can now just go and make myself a cup of tea and stare out the window. Exactly. Yeah. So what about you? Everything you've said, everything you've said, plus our lad. I mean, I love, I used to love teaching live in the classroom, but uh, I'm still doing some classroom teaching because the British Council here in Valencia opened again after the initial Spanish lockdown. So I'm doing a hybrid schedule of sometimes on zoom sometimes going into the center to teach but it's it's not fun and i suspect it's not fun for the students either the class size is a lot smaller they're wearing masks i'm wearing a mask it's difficult to hear what they're saying they struggle to hear what i'm saying sometimes because of social distancing there's no mingling activities there's no board runs there's no work in pairs and if they are working in pairs they're shouting from one side of the classroom to the other so you can't really hear what the other person's saying so it's very very difficult and sometimes i find myself just speaking to the students which i could be doing on youtube let's face it if there isn't that much interaction in the class because you can't do mingling activities Why are you meeting together in the classroom in the first place? So it does seem a bit silly to me. Yeah. And also you start sometimes when I'm in a classroom, it's the same as you. Sometimes I'm in physical classrooms and then the next week, you know, the government says no, da, da, da. And then you have to go back to Zoom again. So, but those times when you're in classrooms, it's also a little bit disturbing sometimes because you kind of think, okay, so there's 13 of us in this room. The tables are positioned in COVID compliant fashion. So they are a certain distance away from each other. There's little markings on the ground and stuff. But then you kind of think 12 of us, sure, we've got masks on, but the the door's closed, the windows are closed. Because if you open the windows, Paris goes through the windows, you know, all the buses and angry drivers beeping and people protesting in the street, literally protesting in the street outside. There, that's where all the people do their protests and stuff. And they do that quite a lot in France. So that it's often a very noisy place. So the windows are closed. And I sometimes think, hmm, is this a good idea? The government said it's okay, but are they wrong? And sometimes I get a bit disturbed thinking, oh, God. And then as soon as everyone leaves, I throw the windows open and I vigorously wash my hands like Lady Macbeth. <laughs> <laughs> like that. And um, all the students wipe their desks down and stuff. But so in some ways, I prefer teaching on Zoom. Yeah, I'm with you. And the point you made earlier about getting together with colleagues, yes, I I miss that. And we don't really do that now because they stagger the class times so as not to have too many students congregating outside in groups. 
And also, you, you can't really use the staff room. So the, the, you can't have a cup of tea with your colleagues and speak about teaching anymore because you, you just go in, do your class and go home again. Now, I hope that's going to change. But at the moment, I'm not enjoying teaching at all in the classroom. All that time with a mask on, it's pretty suffocating. And like you said, teaching with a mask on is pretty weird. It's like... <laughs> so what about your podcast, though? Has that... Did you get a sense that it benefited from the coronavirus outbreak? Did your numbers go up? Did you think more people listened to your podcast and searched for podcasts during the last 18 months? There have been some benefits. We've received feedback from listeners who were very thankful to us for continuing to do the podcast during the epidemic because since 2014, we've been releasing an episode every Sunday. Every Sunday, an episode goes out. And I wanted to continue doing that during the pandemic. And many people thanked us for it. One person actually sent a voice message to say that she was listening to us in bed with coronavirus in a hospital and thanked us for kind of helping her through that. So that was a kind of a, a bonus I didn't expect. I mean, you know, we hope to do some good with our podcast to help increase the level of, of people listening, but we didn't. I didn't expect to get that message. But there were some technical problems with recording because I, I've never recorded over the internet before. Usually my co-host comes to the flat, we record in the same room, and then he goes back again after a nice lunch. But we had to do it over the internet, which I found quite complicated. So I had to release some episodes where the audio quality wasn't very good. And that bothered me quite a lot because I like to have audio quality that's not noticeable. I think if you can't notice the audio, that means it's good enough. And it was quite bad because we use Zoom and other, other things. Yeah, it's pretty complicated uh, doing online recordings like this. Although there's more and more software that's coming that is improving the audio quality of remote uh, conversations like this. Did you, so I think did it's you fo- get... Sorry. Yeah. I was going to say... Gonna say... <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Interesting phrase. I was going to say, which is what you say when you're on Zoom or something or some other video conferencing software and you both talk at the same time. You go, oh, but, but, and then you go, I was going to say... Which is different to, as I was saying, which is a little bit more... <laughs> mm, it sounds bit a bit more, more angry. Yeah, as, as I was, as saying, as before I was I, saying, before I was so rudely interrupted, but... Uh, <laughs> if you'll let me finish... I can't remember what I was going to say now. Me neither. You were going to talk about some software, I think, for recording remote conversations. No, I think that's quite boring for the listeners. I was going to ask you if you had any positive things or, or negative things in respect of your podcast during the coronavirus pandemic, were you producing more episodes? Were you finding more material? What feedback were you getting for your listeners? So again, like what you said, uh, I did get quite a lot of comments from people saying how much they appreciated being able to listen to the episodes during the pandemic. So I think a lot of people uh, who were stuck at home reached out to podcasts or used podcasts as a great way to get contact with people and to make themselves feel a bit better because podcast listening to podcasts is very pleasing and comforting isn't it it helps it helps you feel less isolated i think you feel that the world is a little bit more open if you're listening to a podcast seems to be more people around yeah and it's quite an intimate thing for some reason when you're listening to a podcast you feel like you're the only person sometimes listening to it whereas when you're on the radio When you're listening to the radio, you definitely get the sense that the DJs or radio presenters are talking to lots of people. They're all in their cars and stuff. But a podcast, for some reason, it's you feel like it's more intimate because you're the one who chose to listen to it at that moment. You know that plenty of other people are listening to it too, but at at different times. But you're the only one who's listening to it at that very moment, in a sense. And we often only listen to podcasts on our own. We don't often listen to them with other people there. I got messages from people saying the same thing that that you'd mentioned there. You know, people appreciated being able to listen to the episodes. I feel like I got, in some cases, I think I got new audience from people who were searching for podcasts because they were stuck at home. So I got the sense that new people came to the podcast and discovered it. So in a sense, like, COVID-19 gave the podcast a little boost in a way. But no one's talking about that. None of the conspiracy theorists are saying that, Craig. You know, that you know, there's like COVID conspiracy theorists. Yeah, the whole COVID uh, thing is like a, a weaponized virus to, you know, by the, by the Illuminati to blah, blah, blah. No, 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 no. It was podcasters. Yes. Podcasters. We, we're the ones who were messing with pangolins and bats and things. And we created this thing just to increase our 
statistics. We just want is more download numbers. We are the Illuminati, with the podcast Illuminati. I heard your episode about comments and questions from listeners, and I expect you get a lot of correspondence from people on various platforms, right? You get emails and stuff like that from listeners. Now, do you manage to respond to all of them? How do you manage the correspondence you get from people? I reply to every message that comes in. Yes, you're right. Sometimes they're put on the website as comments that I reply to. Sometimes they come in as emails. We prefer audio messages. So we really like getting audio messages. You mentioned before, we like to put them in the podcast and comment on them. And I think that also helps create a sense of community. But they very often, they're very useful. Apart from building that sense of community, they also give us ideas because people have questions and doubts and they ask things about English and can we speak about this and can we speak about that? So I put a file of ideas together and then when we don't have an idea for like next week, I'll go to the list and say, oh, what should we, what do you fancy talking about next time? So most of the ideas come from the audience. Most of the topics are from the people listening to us. Yeah, obviously, if it's too niche, if it's a bit too specific, if someone wants to hear about chameleon breeding, for example, or underwater basket weaving, then we <laughs> we might not do it because not many people are interested in it. But we try to address or speak about most of the ideas that come into us. That's great. I mean, I do the same thing too. You know, the correspondence from listeners is really useful because it does help you direct you and give you ins inspiration and stuff like that. But I feel a bit bad sometimes because I occasionally get, well, I often get emails throughout the day and I, and I realize that I haven't responded to them and they've just kind of like disappeared into my inbox. Like just today I was thinking, Oh God, there was a woman. I was chatting to a woman by email who sent me a, a recording of Oh, is it one of her students or her daughter speaking English? And it, like we were in a conversation and I realized, oh God, that must have been about three weeks ago because I haven't replied yeah. uh, in three weeks. And now I can't remember what her name is. <laughs> and I don't know how I'm going to find that email because you know I'm going to have to spend ages trawling through them all to try and discover it. And I'm sure there are lots of other examples of emails that unfortunately people who I haven't replied to. So I do feel a bit bad sometimes about getting back to, to people. It's quite a lot of correspondence to deal with. But I think people understand, and I think that's, that's inevitable. That's going to happen as you grow and your, your audience grows. You're going to get more people contacting you, and that's a good thing. That's great. That means people are engaged. And as long as they understand that, you know, you don't have time maybe to, to answer everything personally because you're also working and you're also producing the episodes, then I think people understand. Yeah, I hope so. Now, let's see. So in episode number 337, see, I've got some, num some numbers too of, <laughs> um, of the AIRC podcast which was called Craig's Story. This is the one I listened to back in November. So you talked about various jobs and things you've had. Oh, Craig, hold on. I'm sorry. That's okay. Here comes more noise. Check this out. <laughs> so not, not only is there the noise of the, of the vacuum cleaner downstairs, there's also this. <laughs> so that noise is a siren sounds like an air raid siren every first wednesday of the month in paris at 12 o'clock noon they play air raid sirens all across the city to test the sirens are you serious i'm absolutely serious every month first wednesday of every month at 12 o'clock noon no scary air raid sirens blast all over the city are they expecting an imminent attack from a foreign power i don't know they just do it to test the air raid sirens which i think is odd i mean it first of all that sound is for us for brits is a i guess for other people too is a scary sound because that's the sound they used during the blitz right in the in world war ii yeah it's also the the noise that they would have used in the event of a nuclear attack in the 80s and 70s and i think that sometimes they would test the air raid sirens when we were at school so we've got sort of scary associations with that noise but yeah i don't know i, I don't know if they're expecting some kind of attack or what but if you are planning to attack paris do it at 12 lunchtime on the first <laughs> wednesday of the month everyone's just going to be carrying on like normal 
anyway, that was a really uncalled for tangent. I'm sorry about that. Where were we? I was actually in the middle of a sentence when I shifted to talk about the sirens. I think you were going to ask me something about episode 337. 337. Okay. So that was called Craig's Story. And in that episode, you were talking about your life and you said that you'd done all sorts of different jobs in your life. So I'm just curious, what what is the worst job that you've ever had? And do you have any specific memories of that job? The worst job I've ever had? I think probably sending chickens to market. I don't know if you've, if you've ever done that, Luke. Sending chickens to market. So like, okay, chickens, you're all going to go to the market. So off you go. One by one, giving them an address. No, years ago, I worked on a farm and I had to wake up at 3 a.m. Now, I'm not a morning person. I don't like getting up early. But obviously, the chickens are still sleeping, so they're very dopey. So that's a good time to go and get your chickens. And you go in the chicken house and you have to pick up three chickens in each hand upside down. So you kind of put the chickens in between the chicken legs in between your fingers. So they're they're hanging upside down. Of course, they're then screeching and, and scratching you and flapping their wings. There's all the dust coming up from the, the floor of the chicken house and the smell of the chicken poo. It's it's absolutely disgusting. Yeah. Two hands of unhappy chickens, the noise and, and everything. And then you would, what, put them in a basket or something? You take them out of the chicken house, load them in cages on the back of a truck, and then the, the truck or the lorry would take them away to be sold at, at market, and then they, they end up on your supermarket shelf. So apart from the horrible physical conditions of doing it, it's the realism of seeing what actually happens to your roast chicken when you have to take it away from where it's actually living. It's, it's an emotional thing as well. Yeah. So I think that was probably the worst job I've ever had. But I do still eat chicken, so I'm a bit of a hypocrite, really. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit of a complicated one, isn't it? What was your worst job? I've had a few dodgy jobs, but I, maybe the worst was working as a kitchen porter in a, in a restaurant, in a busy pub. That was in the, U- the UK, yeah, I'm guessing. Back in the UK, yeah, in quite a large pub, a country pub, with probably about 50 tables in it, and a fairly large kitchen, busy weekend lunch and dinner services. And I was the guy responsible for cleaning all the dishes and stuff. And so we had a a large sort of industrial dishwasher, which was like this huge thing, and it would blast whatever you put through it for about three minutes. So it did a full wash in three minutes, whereas, you know, the ones we have at home, they take 90 minutes or two hours or something. This one would be like intense super wash for three minutes. So hot. And anyway, so I'd have my sink in front of me, piles of everything next to me, dishes, plates, knives and forks, pots and pans and everything from the from the kitchen too, as well as from the restaurant, uh, you know, from the tables. And I would have to like clean stuff and then put it into the machine because the machine wouldn't deal with like the really, really stuck in dirt. So especially pots from the kitchen, which have got whatever it is that's caked to the bottom of the pan. And so I would be trying to clean all this stuff off. Basically, I'd be leaning over this hot sink covered in crap. So I'd be covered in mustard and ketchup and gravy and just completely covered in it, steam all rising up into my face. You know, I'd be doing that for like hours. And so my fingers would get all wrinkly. Yeah. No rubber gloves, no dishwasher gloves. No, I just, I, they were offered to me, but I just couldn't do it with the rubber gloves. Like for some reason with the rubber gloves, I'd be dropping plates and things. And it was just much easier to use my actual fingers. And then I'd have to clean the machine at the end of the evening. And that would involve almost climbing inside the thing in order to clean out all of the grime and residual gunk and stuff that had built up inside it. So I would kind of climb inside it and I would emerge at the end of an evening of in the kitchen at like the swamp thing, you know, <laughs> just stinking, greasy, horrible, disgusting monster. How long did you do it for? Oh, years. I probably did that for a few years, maybe two or three years. Was that a job to help get you through university? No, it was before I went to university. It was just a job just, I guess, to give me pocket money which I spent on probably on CDs and clothes and stuff. I probably wasted it. But anyway, it was hard work. Does you good. Bit of hard work. Nothing wrong with it. But anyway, it was pretty grotty. I think I'll stick with my chickens. Uh, Yeah, I prefer teaching English on Zoom. 
actually. But no, I, I do think back to I've done many things, as, as you, you know, if you listen to that particular episode. But when I am teaching and I do rant and complain and moan, I do think back and think, oh, Craig, come on. What are you complaining about? First of all, there are many people who don't have jobs at the moment. You're lucky to be working at all. And secondly, it's lovely. It's a lovely job teaching. It's productive. It's rewarding. You're meeting people. You're helping people. So I think I'm, I'm very lucky. And, it, and it's good to remember those horrible jobs we did when we were younger. Yeah. And, we, and you know, the, our students are all so nice, you know, right? So appreciative. Like teaching English to adults is amazing because people are generally appreciative. Obviously, you get some individuals who are just like not very nice people in their lives, you know, for whatever reason. But for the most part, people are really nice and appreciative, which is lovely. It's incredibly rewarding. It's true. Craig, I reckon we could just keep, what's the word, wittering on, rambling away for ages. It's been really nice to talk to you again about various things. Yes, it has. We did sort of think of some ideas before starting this recording, and we've maybe done about 15%. <laughs> so then we should get together again and not wait five years and do another episode and um, touch on the things that we didn't get to this time we should indeed okay have a nice day Craig you too keep in touch and I'll speak to you soon indeed alright mate bye bye cheers bye bye it was so much fun connecting with Luke and catching up on what's been happening in his life. If you want more of Luke, and why wouldn't you, go to teacherluke.co.uk. Teacherluke.co.uk. And Luke also has an app you can download to your phone. Search for Luke's English Podcast app in the App Store. Also consider signing up to LEP Premium and you'll access a growing library of lessons that Luke has created on vocabulary, grammar and pronunciation. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed that podcast and join Reza and me next episode for another Aprender Inglés con Reza y Craig. <laughs>